Well, last week we started uh, the new series called Here's Your Sign, and we're talking about God's financial road signs for us and how we can uh, live a life that's different by following the signs that God gives us. And uh, last week we talked about stop. There's some things we needed to stop doing. And this week, the sign is yield. How many got the notes? Uh, You have a copy of the notes. How many would like a copy of the notes? Raise your hand if you'd like a copy. Uh, We have some ushers that will serve you. Just raise your hand up. We've got some up here as well. So if you would, grab a copy of those, and you can follow right along. Well, when it comes to theology of money, now don't be afraid of the word theology. It just simply means the study of God. And so when we talk about the theology of something, we're talking about what does God say about it? So the theology of money, uh, when it uh, boils down to it, there are typically three different outlooks. Okay, we got someone here that would like uh, one. You you want one? Okay, no, he's he's putting a lanyard on, okay? But there are three different types of theology when it comes to money. The first and maybe one of the most common It's what I call poverty theology. You say, what is poverty theology? Well, it's the idea that there's never enough. No matter what you do, there will never be enough. And the reason that they feel this way, uh, they feel insecure even if they've got a lot of money in the bank. They feel insecure even if they have no debt. Um, I heard a pastor friend talk about a billionaire with a B, a billionaire that he, he knew, he and his wife were good, strong Christians And they were having a conversation with them, and they both talked about that one day, eventually, they would have enough money, they believed, that they wouldn't have to worry about anything. They were billionaires. And the point is, it's not about how much money you have in the bank. Poverty theology is this idea that there will never be enough, and even though you do believe that God provides, you just don't think he'll really provide for you. And so that's a a poverty theology and what uh, they tend to miss, that God promises to bless you. When you're generous, when you follow God's financial road signs, he will bless you when you worship God rather than money. And and these uh, people that are under this poverty mentality, they tend to be negative and they're dominated by their fear and their anxiety and their worries. Now, if you've ever worried about money, and let's be honest, all of us have, if you've ever worried about the future, then at that moment at least, you were guilty of the poverty mentality that God, even though he created everything, even though he owns everything, even though he promised to supply our need, we feel like maybe there will not be enough. So that's the poverty theology. Then there's what I call the prosperity theology. Now, what is prosperity theology? That is that God is indebted to you. That's in essence what prosperity theology is. This idea that if I'll give a little money, then God's going to give me 10 times back. I put in, it's kind of like putting in money uh, into like a vending machine. I put in something and I get something out. I have an expectation of this. That is the prosperity theology. This group tends to overemphasize material blessings. And and people that are guilty of the prosperity theology, they tend to see God as an ATM, and they oversimplify the meaning of blessing or prosperity. And as I told you last week, the word prosperity means that God is pushing you forward. So it's not just finances. It's not just in material things. Now, make no mistake, you cannot read Scripture And believe that the Bible is the Word of God, as I do and as we do here. Believe that the Bible is inspired. It is the inerrant Word of God. You cannot read Scripture and come away with any other conclusion than when you give, God will bless you. He says, Jesus himself said, the measure that you use to give is going to be used to give back to you. So, in other words, God promises that he blesses us proportionally And that he also blesses us greater than what we do. God promises to take care of us. He promises to rebuke the devourer for our sake. He promises in Psalms. David said, I've 
uh, young and now I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. In spite of uh, all of these things, you can get the wrong view of prosperity. The idea that uh, God, his primary way of blessing you is only financial in nature. And, and, and people in this category make no room for the theology of suffering. And I don't know if you have ever heard that term before. But the theology of suffering is that it is going to be inevitable that in some way or another, we're going to suffer. We're going to face difficulty. We're going to face problems. Now, the, the question is not, do I ever suffer? The question is, is God with you during your suffering? Does God promise to be with you and to help you and to bless you through it? Will he sustain you through this? What is your faith during those times that you have questions? That maybe life didn't turn out exactly like you thought it would. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a circumstance, a situation, and go, well, that's not what I expected. That's not what I was planning. I was talking to someone uh, before the service. We were talking about getting older. And I, I told him, I said, I knew that I was going to get this age. I just didn't expect it to get here so quickly. And, and no matter what it is that you go through, if you've been around long enough, you know that it is inevitable that suffering comes. That it, is, it is inevitable that problems come. Jesus said it was inevitable. But it's also true that God is with us. So the prosperity theology uh, tends to overemphasize uh, that if you are good with your finances, if you give, that you're never going to have any problems. And they don't technically say that there's never any problems, but they, they just emphasize that, you know, you give, you're going to be rich. You give, you're going to get a new Cadillac. You give, well, God does promise to bless you. He does promise to take care of you. He does say that it's more blessed to give than to receive, but he does not promise you that you're going to win the lottery. He does not promise you that just because you give $10 that you're going to get 1000 in return. He promises to bless you, but he does not promise to make you rich. And the truth is, as we're going to see today in the text we read, we all are rich. If we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are rich. So there's the poverty theology, there's the prosperity theology, and then the third thing is this is where we should live. It's what I call grace theology. And this is the premise of grace theology. I am indebted to God. I am indebted to God. Why? Because he is so good to me. He blesses me so much. Although I don't deserve it, that's what grace is. It's unmerited, unearned, undeserved kindness and favor from God. And the truth is, if you have become a follower of Jesus Christ, if you put your faith in him, you have experienced his grace. You didn't earn it. There's no way you could be good enough. You cannot keep even all the 10 commandments. You can't even keep 10, uh, much less everything in life. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But Jesus gives it to us freely anyway, and that is God's grace. And because of his grace, this is where we want to live. We want to recognize the blessings. We want to enjoy the blessings. We want to be thankful for the blessings. And then we want to live with contentment and purpose. Okay, let me just, that's a message in and of itself. Let, let me just kind of tell you how you should live in regard to your finances, in regard to all of life, you should recognize that God blesses you. Recognize it all the time. Be thankful for what God gives you and enjoy it. Did you know that it's okay for you to enjoy the blessings that God gives you? That, that's why he gives them. He, he doesn't do it so you'll feel guilty. Any moms in here? Don't raise your hand. I know there are moms in here. Okay. How many moms have ever done this? My mom used to do this. You know, if I didn't eat what was on my plate, which was rare because, you know, I was like a human vacuum cleaner uh, eating. And some of you have experienced that. You have to have three jobs in order to feed your kids, right? But how many of you moms have ever did, have you ever done what my mom did? And like, if I didn't finish something, well, there are, there are starving children in India. 
And they would be glad to eat this broccoli. And I'm like, yeah, why don't you go ahead and send it to them, Mom? They, they'd appreciate it, and so would I. God does not intend for you to feel guilty for his blessings. And, and sometimes as human beings, we do feel guilty. And you know why we feel guilty? Because we still believe in the merit system. Now, there are things that are good, a meritorious system, okay? Um, young people, I, I would encourage you, learn these principles. When you work hard, you're going to have more opportunity. Work hard. Uh, have a good attitude. Show up early. Uh, be one that does extra. You'll be blessed, I promise you. In the culture that we live in now, you just do a little bit extra. You're going to shine. You're going to really shine, okay? So, so we're not saying that there is no place in life for merit because there are some things you need to do uh, with your job and so forth. But when it comes to God's grace, when it comes to our relationship with God, you can't earn it. It is overwhelming to know that you cannot do anything that makes God love you more. And on the flip side of that, and this is the kicker, this is the one that blows our mind, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You say, yeah, you don't know what I did this week. It doesn't matter. Well, it matters what we do. But when our relationship with God, we must understand he loves us, not because we deserve it, but because that's who he is. And he gives it freely. And so if I'm going to live in that grace, I've got to be thankful. I've got to make sure that I um, uh, thank God for his blessings and then live with contentment and purpose. There is a reason that God blesses you. There are multiple reasons. He blesses us because that's who he is. He blesses us because he loves us. But do you know one of the main reasons that God blesses you? It's not so you can take, you know, an extra vacation. Nothing wrong with vacation. Nothing wrong with taking two if you can, all right? Uh, I recommend it, all right? If you get the chance to take two vacations, do it, okay? But, and, and there's nothing wrong with it. But that's not the purpose of God's blessings in your life. Oh, yes, he wants to bless you. He wants to enjoy life. But listen, you were given a blessing to be a blessing. And that is grace theology. And that's where we want to live. Well, today, we're going to talk about yielding your money to God. Let me read to you from, in fact, one of my favorite passages of Scripture concerning material things and how we react to God and how we should yield this area of our life to God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll read verses 6 through 10, and then we'll skip down and read verses 17 to 19. And the Apostle Paul was writing a young preacher named Timothy. And here's what he said. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Have you ever noticed that when you have contentment in your life, you're much happier? I met a man one time, and he was not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. He, he lived a very simple life. And he told me, his name was Mr. Scott. Uh, he said, you know... He said, son, he called me son because he was much older than I and, and he was talking to me and he said, son, I may be the richest man in the world. I'm like, what? I'd been to his house. I knew that he wasn't the most wealthy man in the world. But he looked at me, he said, look, you know why I'm so rich? I said, why? He said, because there is nothing that I want. I have literally everything that I want. You know what that man experienced? Contentment contentment. But do you know you can be extremely wealthy and discontented with everything that you have? You got to just get one dollar more. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It's better to live with contentment than with discontentment. He said, for we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of the world. I've done many funerals in my life and I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. Because you don't get to take it with you, okay? But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. In other words, he's saying, focus on the blessings. Focus on the blessings. Uh, I doubt there any, there's anybody in here that is starving to death. The truth is, most of us have too much to eat. Be content with what 
God's blessings have been in your life. Recognize those blessings. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Let me explain what that word desire means. It doesn't mean that, hey, I want to raise. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean, well, I want to get a, a promotion at work. That, there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that uh, you, um, don't, you should never, ever desire to save for retirement. That's not what he's saying. The word desire, it means an inordinate lust for more. Envy, jealousy, greed, they all fit in this category. Uh, nothing that I ever get is enough. There is this intense desire. And it's not just that I want more. If there was nobody to compare to, I probably wouldn't want as much as I want, right? But you know what the, the word here describes? It's not just that I want more. Nothing wrong with wanting more. But for most of us, we want more than someone else. Oh, God, I, I don't want to be the wealthiest person in the world. I just want more money than her. God, I'm not saying you have to give me the most expensive car in the world, but I definitely want one better than he drives. Oh, God, you know, I, I'm not saying that I have to live in a mansion, but please let me have a house bigger than theirs. This inordinate desire, it says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare. He's saying that it's a, it's a trap. And, and the, the blessing that God has made available to us can also be a trap. And you must be aware of it. You got to yield to God. Otherwise, you'll fall into that trap. He says, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Have you ever noticed, maybe you've never noticed this, but I have as a pastor, there, I've seen so many people get caught up in this. They get saved, they start coming to church, and maybe they were broke when they started coming. God started blessing them. They started obeying financial principles. They're serving God. They're giving. They're, they're just living a blessed life. And then all of a sudden, they start accumulating things, and they stop looking at Jesus, and they start looking at their things. And what happens? Well, before long, they stop going to church. Oh, it's not, it's not suddenly, you know, you got so many trips a month and there's so much money. You got to go take this and do that. And please mi don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting it's wrong for you to take a trip or go on vacation or go to the beach. But I am saying if we don't watch ourselves, what will happen to us is that we will be discontented because we don't realize that God freely gives us, it says here in this text. He freely gives us all things to enjoy. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. Is the sunset any more beautiful in Hawaii than it is here? The answer is yes. All right, I'm just saying. I, I've been to Hawaii. Okay. No, my, my point is this. The things that God gives to us, we, suddenly, we somehow think, well, I must spend all this money and be on the beach. I love the beach. Okay, I love it. Beautiful. Uh, but God gives everybody the ability to enjoy, enjoy the sunset. Everybody. You can enjoy it right where you are. He gives us all things freely. And so he says, many people fall into these senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I've seen people get ruined. Because of blessings. Isn't that amazing? They get ruined because God's blessing them. And then they start looking at the blessing rather than God. And the problem with when Jesus said you can't worship God and mammon, that was the Babylonian God of wealth. You know what the problem is? The problem is that when you want to worship the money, the stuff, the material things, what you're wanting is you're wanting what God gives but you don't want God himself. You want the blessing, but you don't want the relationship. And, and what a terrible place to be in. If you're a parent, you know that would be horrible if your child, all they wanted was your stuff, your property, your inheritance, but they never wanted to talk to you. They never wanted to come uh, spend Sunday afternoon and eat a meal with you. They never wanted to see you at the holidays. They never wanted to talk to you on the phone. How horrible would that relationship be? 
You would be grossly disappointed. Why? Because all they want is your stuff. They don't want you. And this is what he's describing. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Isn't that an interesting way to describe it? We get blessed. We start really getting blessed. We get some extra money. We get some extra stuff. And all of a sudden, once again, nothing wrong with being rich. I hope every one of you get to be multimillionaires. Am I right? Yeah, amen. All right, so uh, you can say amen to that. But also what I hope for every one of you, listen closely, is that you always keep your eyes on God, not the stuff. Because it's not the stuff that makes you happy. It's not the stuff that fulfills you. You ever notice that you get something new, that before long the new smell wears off, the new feeling wears off, and then all of a sudden you're just like, I need a bigger house. This is not that big, right? Well, he says a lot of people pierce themselves. Spiritually speaking, they harm themselves. And as for the rich in this present age, and here's what he says to do. This is the antidote. By the way, if you make the average household income in this county, you're in the top 3% of the wealthiest people in the world. Did you know that? If you own a car, you're in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. Did you know that our poor people are richer than most people in the world. And I realize that, you know, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll live in a poverty mentality and we'll live uh, thinking that, you know, God's not really blessed us, but he has. Yes, he has. He says, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves. Listen to this. You want God's treasure? By the way, God's treasure never gets old. It never runs out, never rusts, never decays. It is eternal. He says, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the future. Now he's talking about spiritually here, but I believe also financially, when you are content and you manage your money God's way, guess what? You'll have a solid future. But he's really talking about your good works and your generosity. And he says, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Wouldn't it be horrible if you climbed the ladder of success all of your life and at the end of your life you discovered that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall all the time? I, I, like I said, I've done a lot of funerals in my life, but I, I'll be honest, I've never been by the bedside of a dying person, someone that didn't have very long to live. I have never, and I've, I've been to, I don't even know how many, 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 many. I've never once heard anybody say, man, I regret not spending more time at the office. Man, I regret that I didn't, you know, get this stock. Man, I regret that I didn't have, you know what? That's not what they regret. You know what everyone focuses on at the end of their life? The important stuff. Their relationships, their family, their friends. And friend, you and I must learn that what you and I must do is yield our money to God. And that's really yielding our attitude to God. Okay? Now, I won't be as long giving you the points as I was reading that text. Okay? Um, but I wanted to give you a good foundation to, to understand what it's talking about. How do I yield my money to God? Number one, I must yield my perspective about money. You see, I've got to think biblically about money. I've got to see God as my source. When I start understanding that God is my source, I can get out of the poverty mentality, the poverty theology. I can get out of the prosperity theology, and I can get into the grace theology. And I can begin to see that God is my source. I've got to manage my attitude about money. I've got to foster contentment. Have you ever noticed that if you don't foster contentment, if you don't do it on purpose, 
you're likely not going to be content. There was a time in my life, and I'll just give this as an illustration. There was a time in my life uh, when I was younger that I needed, and I use that word loosely, I needed a new car before my old one was paid off. Anybody ever been in that uh, delusion? And I lived that way for a while. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to foster contentment. And I won't give you the whole story, uh, but God blessed me a number of years ago with a very, very nice car. Uh, it was about worth about almost $70,000, and I only paid $20,000 for it. And uh, so God really, really blessed me, but I decided that I was going to be content. And I've driven that car now for 15 years. 15 years. This is my 15th year. Now, that didn't automatically happen. Now, it's almost a point of pride. (laughs) I've driven it this long. I'm going to see how long I can drive it. You know, you ever get there? A lot of times you're not there when you're a young person. As you get older, you're like, you know what? I don't want to pay for any other car. I'm going to keep on driving this one because it gets me from point A to point B. And and the only reason I tell you that story is because you've got to learn to foster contentment. You may not need, I'm just going to say, you may not need to upgrade your phone before your contract runs out. I'm just saying, okay? The truth is, if we don't foster contentment, and I'm not against having new phones, but I am against wasting money. You see what I'm saying? And we've got to learn that we've got to yield our perspective to God. We've got to be thankful. We've got to recognize that money is temporary. At best, it's temporary. And we've got to see that true wealth is a relationship with God. That's the true wealth. And then we've got to break the yoke of covetousness like I talked about early and recognize the potential for distraction and pain. You ever heard the little phrase, be careful what you ask for because you might get it? Sometimes we think that we want something financially and eh, maybe we don't really want it. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. Before we started this church, I flew literally every week of my life. I flew all over the country and literally many other countries uh, speaking. That's what I did. And um, so I was always looking for, you know, an upgrade on the, on the airplane or looking to get earlier on a flight if I could. And I remember being in the Dallas airport, coming back to Atlanta, and uh, I, my flight was like five or six hours later. And I was praying, oh, God, please let me get on an earlier flight. There was a flight that was coming up in like 30 minutes. God, please let me get on that flight. Please, please let me get on that flight. And sure enough, God answered my prayer. And I got on that flight and I was like, yes. And I was seated in the very back of the plane. And I was very lucky because I had a seat on my right side and a seat on my left side. These were the only two seats left on the plane that were not occupied. And I was like, how blessed am I? I am so thankful that I, oh my goodness, you saw two people get on the plane. I'm not going to describe them in an unkind manner. I'll just say it this way. They had foundation, all right? Do you know what I mean when I say that? These two people were, they could barely get down the aisle. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. These are the only two seats. And I was a human sandwich for the entire flight. And I must say, and and I'm not trying to be unkind, they had not heard of the invention that is a wonderful invention in our country called deodorant. All right. So, and I'm sitting there for two, two and a half hours, and I'm squashed the whole time. I can't get my elbows on the, 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 the rest, and I'm having to hold my breath. I can't hold my breath for two and a half hours, okay? But my point is this. <laughs> Don't miss it. Be careful what you ask for. Sometimes you might get it. Listen to Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best, and your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over. You see, we got to see money as a tool. It's just simply a tool. Nothing right or wrong about a tool. It's what you do with it that matters. 
Then Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here's a second thought. I must yield my pride about money. And I won't spend a lot of time on this, but he said, charge those who are rich in this world not to be proud. That's what he's saying. Not to be haughty. And once again, we don't need to be prideful about possessions. The covetous heart doesn't just want more. It wants more than someone else. The covetous heart doesn't want just to be pretty. It wants to be prettier than someone else. You see what I'm saying? We've got to learn to yield this pride. We put our hope in God. Pride can take the form of poor money management, by the way. Did you know that? I call this the syndrome of the $40,000 a year millionaire. Now, if you're very good at math, you know that most likely if you're making $40,000 a year, unless you find some invention or make some incredible investment, you're probably not going to be a millionaire in a couple years. Now, if you make wise investments for a long period of time, yeah, you can be. But you know what I'm talking about? It's the people that live above their means. They spend money that they don't have to buy things that they don't need to impress people that they don't even like. And, and I've seen so many people that live this way. They drive the latest. They wear the latest. They have to have the latest watch, the latest this, the latest that. And what happens is they are guilty of the very thing that God said, don't do, don't take pride in your possessions. And they're guilty of this because they don't see God as the source and they're not content and they're not wise. Uh, You need to prepare for the future. It can be a sinful act of pride not to. And I'm not a financial manager, but I do know this. This It's a very, very, very simple thing. You spend less than you make. You get that one principle down, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. You may not be as rich as Elon Musk, and that's okay. But you'll be fine if you spend less than you make. You got to prepare for the future. You got to manage debt properly. You got to save for the future and spend less than you make. You got to work hard. By the way, that is a principle that some people don't recognize as a biblical thing, but it is. The Apostle Paul wrote, he said, if you don't work, don't eat. That was the principle. God wants you to work hard. There's a purpose to work. There's a blessing to work. Just a few verses that deal with this. Proverbs 27, 23, and 24. Know the state of your flocks and put your heart... In the caring for your herds, for riches don't last forever. And he's saying, be wise, plan, prepare. Proverbs 21, 25, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Learn how to manage your money. Proverbs 21, 20, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. Now, I didn't call you a fool. God did. All right. Now, this word fool, there's a couple of meanings of the word fool in the book of Proverbs. The, the main one is a fool is a person that rejects God. They are a fool. Uh, they're foolish because they don't believe in God. They're foolish because they don't have a relationship with God. But the second one, and, and often used, and I believe in this text as well, in this context, is a person that is inexperienced. A fool, not because they're dumb, not because they're stupid, but because they don't have life experience yet. They they don't, they're not aware. They've never done this. They're rookies. And and here's what God is saying, that if you spend whatever you get, you haven't learned very much yet. Got to say, Proverbs 21, 20, the wise man saves for the future. Ecclesiastes 6, 9, it's better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. By the way, that was written by the richest man in the world. 
That's pretty good advice. Now, you know, if you're broke and you don't have two pennies to rub together, I may not listen to your financial advice. But the richest man in the world, I might listen to him. And this was divinely inspired scripture. Solomon wrote it. He said, it's better to be satisfied with what you have than to always be wanting something else. Good advice. And then Isaiah 52, 55 two. why spend money on what does not satisfy? That's a great question, isn't it? Don't spend on what doesn't satisfy. Now, I, I don't really have time to deal properly with the last point, but let me just give it to you. I must yield my purpose for money. What is your purpose? God has given you a blessing so that you can be a blessing. He has given this to you so that you can follow his principles about not only financial management, but generosity. We talked about tithing last week. It's very, very important. You will get God's blessings on your life when you do that. But you've got to yield the purpose of money to God. You, God has a purpose for your life. Let me just uh, end with this little story. Uh, one of our longtime members, very faithful member, uh, Martin McDonald, his wife Susan, they've been here for a long time now. And, and Martin is one of these people that um, always doing something. Uh, when we had the building, he was always around there doing something and uh, building something or fixing something. And uh, man, it was just a real blessing to the church. And um, I did not know this until a few years ago about him. He has this, this it's not really, a, it's not a company, but he, I'll call it kind of a semi-business. And what he does is he gets donations from like, places like Walmart and places like that. And for a while, he had lots and lots and lots of bicycles that he would get that had been donated. He would go fix them, and then he'd go give them as a gift to a child in need. And now he also takes stuff from Walmart or other places like that, not just there, but he'll get their stuff, and he'll take it and deliver it to single moms, uh, to people in need, to people that need help and hope. And he does that. He doesn't toot his own horn. I, I'd ask him permission to share this story. I, I knew him for years before I knew that he did that. Now, what is my point of telling you that story? There is a way for you to be generous. There is a way for you to do good works. There is a way for you to be a blessing. I believe it begins with the tithe. You bring the tithe to the storehouse so that there can be food in my house, says the Lord of hosts. But then... You can find ways to be a blessing. Not about having a lot of money. You don't have to be rich to be a blessing. You don't have to be a millionaire to help somebody else out. You don't have to be the wealthiest person on the block or have everything together in your life even. We often think that, well, you know, God wouldn't really bless me because, you know, I don't have this area of my life together. But that's not true. God will use you, listen, if you're willing. The Apostle Paul wrote about that. He said, you're not going to be judged for what you don't have, but for what you do. God's not going to say, why didn't you give a million dollars if you never had a million dollars? No, don't ask that. He is going to ask, why didn't you give, you had a hundred dollars, why didn't you give any of that? Why didn't you do anything? You had time. You had talent. You could help somebody, but you didn't. It's not according to what you don't have, but what you do have that God requires and blesses you. And when you do, man, there's more blessing. That's the wonderful thing about this. When I began to be generous, Jesus told this. If you don't believe my words, I'm sure you'll believe Jesus' words. He says, basically, in essence, you can't outgive God. Whatever measure you use to give, that same measure is going to be used to give back to you. But he said it's going to be multiplied. He said, he said it's going to be shaken down, pressed together, and running over. That was really kind of an old farm metaphor, an old farm term. Because whenever they would get a bushel of wheat or whatever measurement they used... When you really wanted to get every bit of your money's worth, you didn't just pour the wheat into a bushel basket. You know what you did? You shook it. 
and, and you shook it down. I had a, a teacher in high school. His name was Mr. Thompson. And he was retired, but what he did was he, um, he taught driver's ed. And one of the things that he got for teaching driver's ed was he got a free tank of gas every week uh, when he came to our school. And I'll never forget watching Mr. Thompson fill up his old pickup truck. He would fill it, and then when it would get to the top, he would grab the back of that truck and start shaking it. He would shake it, and he, he'd get a little bit more in there, and he'd shake it some more. He wanted to make sure there wasn't any air bubbles in there. You know what he was doing? He was getting a blessing. It was being pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, let me tell you, God didn't say that's what you do. He said that's what he does. Whenever you learn these principles and you yield your attitude to God about money, you yield yourself to God. Here's what God says. I'm going to bless you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that truck and I'm going to start shaking it. I'm going to make sure that there's no air bubbles left in it. And I'm going to give to you, press down, shaken together and running over. That's what I'm going to do for you. That's what God says. That's what God says. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us to follow that road sign of yielding to you. Our attitude, every part of our life, help us to yield to you. Lord, I pray now for every member of our church, everyone watching online, uh, everyone that uh, joins in here occasionally or regularly. God, that you'd help all of us to obey these principles. God, I pray that you'd meet people's needs. I pray that you'd bless them financially, but help us to realize that we can get so focused on finances that we miss our relationship with you. Help every one of us not to be guilty of that, but to be aware, to trust you. You're our source. You give us grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But my goodness, you give it. And Thank you for that. Help us to be thankful. I pray that you'd meet the needs for those that are in debt, those that are, maybe they've been laid off. Maybe they had a cut in their pay at work. God, but you'd be with them and bless them. Those that have expenses that are just weighing them down. Kids, kids in college, kids in school. Things break down. Lord, help them to keep their mind on you. And to realize that you give us everything to enjoy. Before I finish my prayer, I wonder if I could pray for you about giving your life to Jesus Christ. You know what? It's one thing to give your money to him, but if you don't give your life to him, it doesn't really matter if you give him your money. It's not going to buy you one second of heaven. But what you can do is give your life freely to him and receive him by his grace through faith. You say, Pastor, I'd like to do that. Well, why don't you say something like this in your heart? Or you can say it out loud if you're at home. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me and resurrected from the grave. And I believe you'll save me if I'll ask. And right now I'm asking. I'm asking you to save me. Today, if you prayed that prayer or something like that, in the room, please take the next step card. Jonathan's going to come in just a minute and give you an opportunity to fill that out or if you're at home please go to the bottom of the screen and fill that out but just commit your life to God then last thing before I finish my prayer is there anybody in the room that would say pastor I'm struggling with some things financially maybe you got debt maybe you got worries maybe you're afraid of your losing your job Maybe your retirement's coming up and you're like, oh my goodness, I've lost a third of my retirement. I don't know if I'm going to be able to retire. But there's some worry, some concern that you've got about finances and you want to pray, help me to yield to God. Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that? A lot of folks. Father, help us to yield to you Realizing that you are our source, you give us grace, you supply freely. And God, help us to worship you and to praise you. In Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.